we've got 13 days to go until general election 2024. Do you know who you're going to vote for? Good evening and welcome to Face to Face for the News First Team. I'm Niresh Aliyatambi. Well, you've got a wide choice this time. Dozens and dozens of political parties. You've got the mainstream ones, the ones which have been around for 30, 40, 50 years uh, and there are little offshoots and you've got a lot of young parties, new parties, um, which are bringing forth new candidates, young men and women, um, not so young men and women. Uh, and of course, to discuss all this, we have one of those candidates today, uh, Mr. Prashant Divisa, who is uh, running from the National Development Front. Mm -hmm. uh, Prashant, um, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, and of course, you are no stranger uh, to the show. Uh, Prashant, uh, tell us about what you're doing. You're running from the Gampaha district. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what's your party doing? Is it going nationwide mm -hmm. or is it in a few districts? Yes. So we started our journey as a political movement. We call ourselves the Centenary Movement. Uh, but then as a party, we're calling ourselves the National Development Front. We've come to uh, work together with an, a generation that has been around uh, believing in the kind of values that we have and a younger generation coming together and we are active in all all across the country but as we looked at things after the presidential election we felt it was important for us to use our resources and our energy wisely and we've picked four crucial districts to make our first entrance in the political arena. Gampaha is one which I'm leading the team. We have also contesting in Hambantota, in Trincomalee, and in Puttalam district. And we're looking to really ask people, don't vote blindly on party loyalty. That's what got us into the mess in the first place. Vote on the people who would represent you in parliament, on their capacity to deliver and represent you, and to ensure that Sri Lanka doesn't make the same mistakes of the past, where blind loyalty to party and then trying to preserve political lifespan at the cost of the nation's development doesn't take place anymore. Okay, now you're running from four districts, mm -hmm. uh, as I understand. Uh, what are those districts? Hambantura, Trincomalee, Putalum, and Gampa. Right. Uh, why those four? Why not uh, for other districts. Yeah. So strategically, we looked at the map and we found what are the chances? Because as a brand new party, what you really want to do is to make an entrance to parliament. It's never been done. Normally, to enter parliament, you have to be one of the big parties or you need to be in alliance with the big party. Uh, and we don't want to do that because we feel it compromises the values. And we don't really, if we fully agreed with any of these parties, we would have joined them in the first place. Why take this difficult road? Um, and so when we looked at what's the best map, electoral map for us to make a few entrances, pull off a few surprises, beat the odds, make history. And we felt in these districts, the caliber of candidates we had, the reach of our membership, and also our ability to um, engage in those communities were better suited at this time. And that's why we picked those districts right now. Now, Prashant, um, Sri Lanka has a long history of small parties. Mm -hmm. uh, you had the Liberal Party, the Communist Party, the LSSP, NSSP, um, so many. Um, and some of them did get MPs into Parliament. Mm. Uh, but in the end, they had to ally with a main party mm. uh, after getting into Parliament. Uh, for example, Mrs. Uh, Sirma Bandarnaika's coalition of the 1970s had almost all the left parties, the left-wing parties, mm -hmm. uh, in that coalition, um, which made it exceptionally strong. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you get a couple of MPs into parliament, um, would you uh, consider allying with the government, whether it be the SJB or the NPP, mm. uh, or would you prefer to go it alone? Yeah. First of all, we felt that if you do try to ally or lean on existing parties before an election, you become beholden unto them. You're not able to raise your concerns against some of the grievances that you see, some of the mistakes that they're about to repeat, because once you're part of that political culture, we feel that you're consumed by it. 
and you make compromise after compromise and then you don't recognize who you are and you don't realize why you came into it in the first place. It's not about just saying we just want to get into power, let's just try and fulfill that agenda. That's not the goal here. We want to see a new political culture we, because we can't continue to do politics as usual. Sri Lanka is a bankrupt country today. We have not lived up to our potential. Something has gone terribly wrong. It's almost like a train, like a plane crash. You have to look and say what hasn't worked. And it's not just uh, corruption. It's also the political parties and the establishment and the career politicians as well. So we can't question that challenge that hold it accountable if we align right now. However, if some of us make it to parliament, our goal will to build to reevaluate at that time because then you have your identity preserved, you can still hold on to those values and challenge whoever you are aligning with. But we will make that decision at that point. The first hurdle is to try and make history here to try and win uh, those seats. And then we'll evaluate at that point. Okay, so what are you promising the people? Because when you go and meet people door to door or mm. campaign rallies or whatever, and social media and so on, um, what is it that you are promising to do for the people. Yeah. So there are a few things. In the legislature, we need independent voices that are not slaved or bound to a party loyalty or to government loyalty. In the sense of, we've seen governments have come, had two thirds, everybody in that party would raise hand for the good, the bad and the ugly, whatever, just to stay toe the party line at the detriment of the nation. We pledge to be independent voices that can cannot be bought over that will speak up because some people in the opposition in the previous opposition say we were in the opposition we never had power that's why we couldn't you know change the reality you are paid by the people of sri lanka to be in opposition and while you were there for 20 30 years sri lanka became bankrupt we've had violations of human rights human the journalists have gone missing our country has been bad we had terrorist attacks have been horribly managed and you're responsible for it as well and you can't, so we feel that if you want somebody who will be held accountable, who will be an independent voice, who will speak up for the people and be a stronger resistance, then that's why you should bet on us. Because we're not okay with the mediocrity that we see. We're not entering into do politics as usual. We want to see change. We see these COPE committee hearings all the time. And at times on live television, we find out there's been major corruption. But has one of those people been brought to justice? Have the parliamentarians had the resolve and the cap capacity to ensure that there's justice and stop those in injustices and corruptions continue? There hasn't been. Mediocrity has set in and they're satisfied with doing the bare minimum. We need fresh blood. We need new insight. And we can't afford to do that in the establishment. So we're coming from outside. You want to see a new culture? Give us an opportunity. But at the same time, I believe it's not just in the legislature. If I am a representative of the Gampaha people, I need to represent my people. I need to understand their grievances. A lot of these career politicians only come to the electorate during election season. Right now, many of them can't come to the electorate because they're afraid for their safety, for obvious reasons. But we want to be accountable to our people and serve our people. Poverty in Gampaha has doubled. Malnutrition among children has doubled. People are suffering. Uh, entrepreneurs and medium-sized and small-sized businesses have been devastated. And these politicians don't seem to care. Don't even want to know what went wrong. See how we can change that reality. We are problem solvers. We want to respond to these issues, find sustainable solutions, and we can do a better job if we have uh, the authority as parliamentarian for the district. Now, a um, couple of points that you mentioned. Uh, the SME sector, the small and medium enterprises. Gampaha district is full of them, was even fuller yeah. of them. A um, lot of them have... Uh, closed down over the past couple of yeah. years. Uh, how exactly uh, would you go about resuscitating them? Yeah. So first of all, whoever is in government has a large role to play. But that doesn't mean those who are in opposition or even those who want to serve the community have nothing that they can do. First of all, we need to identify the bureaucracy and the elements that make business difficult. Made the bureaucracies that suck the life out of these businesses and highlight it, expose it, and say, this is happening. Either it's corruption or it's just inefficiencies. And let the country know this is happening and this is why these guys are quitting or this is why they're not able to thrive. And not only just shedding light on it, but then working hard to correct those issues is, is one role that a, a representative of the district can do. But at the same time, you as a representative can go 
and understand what are the investments they need, what's the support systems they need. And as an individual, you can help bring in those investments. You can help bring in those support systems that these businesses can thrive. And then also, you need to spend time sitting down and talking to these business leaders and asking, what's going on? What's, how can we serve you better? When's the last time you heard a politician come and ask you in a non-election year, how can we serve you better? All the promises under the sun they're making, but there were representatives from all these three major parties from Gampa district. Have business leaders been able to talk to them about their problems? You can't get them on the phone. They don't represent you. They just used you. They took your vote, maybe even your money, for their expensive campaigns, and they left you hanging. During the economic collapse, entire families were devastated because they were dependent on these businesses. They took a risk. They invested in this economy. They trusted their leaders, and they're still suffering. Now another group is coming and giving them a whole bunch of promises. But you need leaders who are accountable to you. You need leaders who will be a voice for you. You need leaders who will deliver results. You need leaders who are capable of doing something in Sri Lanka and abroad to make sure that you get the investments that you need. You get the atmosphere that you need to do a thriving business. But uh, let me ask you for something more specific. Now, um, small and medium businesses mm -hmm. uh, which were unable to pay their bank loans, yeah. um, whether it is, was for a loan for uh, to start a business or overdraft uh, for a vehicle whatever um, over the past couple of years uh, hundreds of thousands yeah. of them literally nationwide uh, have gone belly up mm. uh, and they were unable to pay their loans yeah. um, so mm. quite apart from everything else they were reported to the crib mm -hmm. the credit information yeah. bureau uh, which means that it's highly unlikely that they'll be able to get a fresh loan. Yeah. So even if they want to start up again, um, let's take a, a shopkeeper. Uh, he needs some choice. capital, some working capital to, to buy goods uh, uh, because goods on credit is very rare these days. Um, so he can't approach a bank because there's this crib report. Mm -hmm. um, and the SME... Uh, sector has been continuously crying out for a moratorium mm -hmm. on this uh, for a couple of years so that then they can get back on their feet, yeah. they can replay the loans um, and then get their names out of the crib. Um, what, what would you say to an idea like that? So this is where we see the system is broken. <coughs> the politicians who are supposed to represent you have used you and now in your time of need in a crisis that was not caused by you in the first place. It was caused by these very established politicians who were in the government and in the opposition who let this happen. So now you need a new culture to change that. You need people who would actually speak for you, who would help your grievance not just be heard, but work tirelessly to put things right. We cannot afford, because then what finally happens is more brain drain continues. If they feel like, my country is not helping me serve my country, and now I can't even feed my family. They're packing up and leaving. We can't afford to have people who have the entrepreneurial spirit, who are willing to take a risk, who want to do something for the economy, create jobs. They've put everything on the line. You know, they were paying people salaries even in the midst of the pandemic. They were trying, so Easter Sunday attacks, and then the economic crisis. How much can they take? And how often did the government, all these career politicians come to their rescue? They're not asking for handouts. They're just asking for fair play. But there's never been a clear voice in Parliament to talk about their situation. Neither has been a clear voice to talk about the child who's malnourished, neither about the small and medium businesses, neither about um, families that have just been devastated by the crisis after crisis, especially those who are still mourning the loss after Easter Sunday attacks. They have been used, their hurt has been used to gain votes but there's no clear vision or a strategy or a commitment to deliver. Well, let's talk about malnutrition, uh, which is hitting the population very hard. Mm -hmm. um, something like 7 million people are below the poverty line mm -hmm. uh, throughout Sri Lanka. That's about one in every three Sri Lankans. Uh, and the reason they're below the poverty line, uh, there's a lack of jobs, uh, and also the cost of living is very high. Um, our exchange rate, uh, with, I mean, the rupee plunged a couple of years ago. So all that uh, came into play. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you set about sorting out this cost of living mess? Mm -hmm. um, quite apart from 
the usual, you know, government uh, trying to have price control, which doesn't work. Mm. How would you set about it? Yeah, first of all, it's almost like medical triage. You need to identify what are some urgent needs that have to be responded to. And for me, and as a party when, in a movement, when we started looking at it, <coughs> malnutrition among children under the age of five is alarming. It's at a very high rate and continues to be at a high rate. Government can't say, well, it's not a big problem because they're trying to almost hide it or almost yeah, access it. It's an enormous it's a, problem. It's a massive issue. UNICEF has reported on it. International organizers reported on it because the long-term damage of this, if a five-year-old or somebody under five is malnourished for an extended period of time, their immune system is going to be weak when they're Their growth adults. is stunted. Their growth is stunted. Their intellectual capacity is also compromised. So we are going to have a workforce that's literally stunted in multiple levels. And you can't say, okay, let's let's kick that can down the road like they do with their loans and, and all these other issues. This needs to be responded to immediately. This is a crisis. And so what we're saying is you need to have better systems in place. Now, we as a party, before the election, we identified uh, 200 children just in one seat in Gampa um, under the nutrition line, literally on the red line, right? And we worked with the midwives and the MOH officers. We tried to figure out the proper nutrition. We educated the parents. Within five months, as an independent organization, we were able to bring 200 children out of malnutrition from the red line to the green line. We were there every month measuring them, weighing them, talking to the midwives, what's working, what's not, how can we do this better? You can do this for all of these kids. We need to get them out of this. And we to, then we created small sustainable farms for those communities to now grow their own food to ensure that those children don't have to go back into malnutrition status again. This can be done at a government level. It can. If you're an actual official representative, you can change that reality. We have to have the urgency and the compassion to respond. Our previous regime was not capable of being compassionate. Oh, we're bringing stability, stability. So yes, people are suffering. What to do? That's not good enough. You well, have to the, the definition of stability was stretched quite a bit, I think. Uh, and uh, uh, quite frankly, those who were in the last government should look up the dictionary. Mm -hmm. um, the word stability, which uh, I agree, yeah, uh, had nothing to do with uh, what they were saying. Mm -hmm. um, now, you mentioned that once a politician gets elected to parliament, or wherever, whichever body. Uh, it's so difficult for the voters, the public, to get through to them. Mm -hmm. um, we know why that is, uh, because they are too busy making money uh, and <laughs> running from one meeting to another and uh, cutting ribbons and opening things and uh, perhaps going to funerals as well. That's, that's another favorite pastime. Uh, so the real voter simply can't go and meet them. Uh, how would you take care of this issue, which is a very key issue, because yeah. in the end, the members of parliament are living in a fool's paradise, because those around them are telling them what a wonderful job they are doing, mm. yeah. and how well the country is doing, like like the old stability joke that mm. uh, you know I just uh, spoke of. Um, uh, the last president thought he had brought stability to mm. the country, and then he garnered 17% of mm. the vote. So uh, clearly he didn't bring stability. Yep. Um, so how, how would you get through to these politicians? What, yeah. what is the mechanism? In the very ethos of our party, we decided that in, in Singapore, the word for politician is Desha Palaka. It has a connotation <coughs> of you're ruling over the people, you're lording over the people. And we want to change that ethos into Desha Sevaka. I am serving the people. They are the boss. We're serving them. It's almost like the government sector goes on without a performance evaluation. Uh, is your, are, are your employees satisfied? So that's that's absolutely comes, correct. Yeah, so it comes maybe at the election, they get a subscribe, but for five years, there's no performance evaluation. Now, we, have, we know we're not going to make government. We're not going to be even the main party in opposition. We're trying to get a few seats in parliament. Our goal is to represent our people in our districts, whether it's Hambantara, Puttaram, Trinko or Gampa, and not just represent, represent them with the level of accountability, transparency and accessibility that they need to us so that we will be the best representation for them. So we want to prove to them on the job so they will have more confidence in the years to come. We will show that we're problem solvers. We're not just going to, be going to make excuses. We're not going to point fingers at the government or the other members of the opposition. You voted for me. I am accountable to you. 
what's happened is this mediocrity that has set in is like doing bare minimum. So they just figure, what, what can we do to keep them satisfied? What do we give? It's a band-aid solutions to the problems. They don't have the imagination to think of so solutions. They don't have the work ethic to bring it about. Maybe they don't even have the credibility to raise the funds and the resources to make something happen because of their own tainted past. So people have suffered. But we're saying we're able to problem solve and we want to. We care about the people and you deserve representatives in parliament who can deliver. And that's why we're putting ourselves out there. But uh, uh, Prashant, you know, getting down to the nitty gritty of it, when a politician is elected to parliament, um, you can call that person on his mobile phone. He won't pick it up. Mm -hmm. He won't return your calls, he or she. Um, you can WhatsApp them, SMS them. Most of the time, they're not going to return your messages. Um, you can call the officers. You'll just get some secretary who will take down your name. You don't get a call back. Uh, you can email them. You're hardly likely to get a, a response. So how do you do this? Yeah, so the excuse has always been we're busy running government or we're busy no, being they're, ineffective. No, they're not. They're yeah. not busy. They yeah. are deliberately keeping themselves yeah. away so, from the public. Definitely. So that, that's not an excuse. They shouldn't do it. But the excuse that they do present is government work is busy or being opposition is busy. We're saying we're running for office to be available to the people. We want to represent you. We are accessible. You would know where our people are. And we also are trying to create systems of, you know, even the right to recall. You can come and complain to the party saying, we appoint, we voted for this person to go represent us. But as a party, you said that we can recall, we, we, we want you to remove this person as a party. In fact, every nominee has signed a legally binding contract with us that they're not going to be involved in horse trading. They're not going to be violate the values of the party. And they're not going to betray the trust of the people, that they would be different. And so we want to build that new political culture. That's another reason that we felt you need to have a size that you can manage. Of, you know, if we do this thing, how can we ensure that we hold them accountable to serve at that level? And to show this is what public service should look like. Whatever has been, been done in the past hasn't worked. The people are not satisfied. The country has not developed. We're still in the same mess. It's time that we change the entire structure. And it begins with individuals who want to step in and serve in this manner. Now, Prashant, um, parties which come to office, because I... I, I I detest the word power, mm. uh, parties which are elected to office um, with a particular platform, um, within a few weeks or months, they veer off it. They, the, the entire party goes in another direction. Um, and because of our setup within parties and within parliaments, um, all the members of parliament from that particular party will always vote for that party, okay. what, whatever. Mm -hmm. So if, 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 even if the, the bill that they're voting for is ludicrous, mm -hmm. um, in, which is clearly anti-national uh, against the people's uh, interests, uh, they will still vote for it. Um, you, you could uh, yep. ha have a, a bill saying people need to stand on their heads, they would still vote for it. On party line. Now, now uh, how do you um, get those members of parliament who represent, after all, the people and their salaries are paid by the people, um, how do you allow them to vote according to their conscience? Okay. So that's the challenge of the established political parties and the career politician, is now it's inbuilt into the <coughs> DNA that they will tow party line, party before country, their political longevity before their conscience. That's been the story all along. We've seen people we thought were educated and refined and so on, just do the same thing. We've seen people with no education do the same thing. So this has become, it's a disease of the established political culture. And that's one of the reasons that we choose to stay away uh, from those structures. So what we want to see is we have to ensure that there's a clear voice raised in parliament that would expose these things day in and day out and change the culture. Now, one of the things that we have been advocating for is public declaration of assets every year, not just during the election, and publicly declare. You put it out so that people have access to it, that they don't have to go somewhere, look at documents, get sick. Don't make it so bureaucratic that nobody wants to do it, but you need to be held accountable. 
we're asking everybody to do it. And and then you're creating a culture of, okay, I'm accountable to the people. I better watch my watch everything I do here. And then representation. We've been asking for more representation of women, more representation of young people. They continue to make these excuses that it's not possible. But we're saying, let's walk the talk. Everything that they say is not possible, we could do it in civil society. They won't take us any, any notice. But if you can come into the political structure and walk the talk, then you're helping shape the culture where the others need to conform to that. So we're seeing some positive refining of society and the political culture. We need to keep at it. And if you need voices in parliament to ensure that that's happening, give us an opportunity. We are in conversation with Prashan Divisa, who is running for parliament from the Gampaha district. We're going to cross over to a short commercial break right now. Don't go away, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Face to Face. We are in conversation with Prashan Divisa, who is running for parliament from the Gampaha district. Now, Prashan, uh, tell us a little bit about your roots in the Gampaha district. You're actually from Gampaha. You're not one of those uh, politicians who jumps from one district to another for convenience, just trying to get uh, elected from that district. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was born and raised in Gampaha. My children go to school in Gampaha. I've served my community. And Gampaha is very diverse. You've got people who are middle, upper middle, and then also people in the lowest economic strata in society. And, and I had the privilege of growing up with people from different backgrounds. Uh, I care for the people. It, it's, it's sad that it's 2024 and some of their lives are actually worse than it was 20 years ago. And that's one of the reasons, in fact, you know, people that I grew up with, played cricket with, they're saying, you know, people like you, you're well educated, you'll have opportunities, and y'all are staying away from the political arena. Our lives are getting worse. And you're just talking about it, do something about it. And I just wanted to stand up and serve. Now, if you're entering into politics, first of all, starting it from a new political party is difficult. You know, trying to go against the grain, very difficult. Now, trying to pick your first battle in Gampa is even more difficult. But I don't believe in shortcuts. I don't believe in just doing what's... You have... If you, it's, it's a, your value is that you're from this community, you have to serve the community. Yes, Gampa is known to... Some of the major candidates are not born and raised in Gampa, they, most of them don't even live in Gampa. But they come because there's a lot of votes there and they try to build their national brand here. I'm here because I'm from the community. I know people from every ethnic, religious and socioeconomic background in Gampa and I know I can serve you well. I know I can deliver results and I'm asking for an opportunity to serve. I will be a consistent voice, I'll be an accessible voice for change and I will deliver on results and that's why I feel because I care enough for the community, I want to serve. Now, this is the very first time that you are running for office. Mm -hmm. um, let's let's hope that you do get in, but assuming that you don't, mm -hmm. uh, what then? We've got another election coming, um, the local government elections. Of course, the nomination lists that were filed, oh my goodness, about two years ago, mm. um, and the election wasn't held. Uh, those nomination lists, as far as we know, are still valid. Uh, although some parties of those, have changed, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> parties uh, may have changed. Uh, certainly, the landscape has mm -hmm. changed. Uh, some of those nominees for local government um, are also running for parliament mm -hmm. now, so they would be in parliament. Uh, so we're not sure um, what the situation would be. But if the nominations were called afresh, uh, would you then? run for local government perhaps? Yeah. So first of all, what we felt is when we took this step, you know, walk the talk, you can curse the darkness or trying to be the light. We said we're going to enter into this. It's not just for one election. We have a commitment. We're saying for the next 20 years, we're here to serve. We're here to challenge what we don't like and try to live the talk and bring about change and serve our people well. So one election is not going to make us run away, but we're going to consistently get better and serve. Our goal is to win a few seats in this parliamentary elections, and we will do our very best to do that. Despite the odds, we feel we have a shot, and we're going to give it everything we have. If that doesn't work, we're ready. Even actually, we had nominees for the previous election, the local government election. Uh, we will refine that list because some of them are running for parliament, or some of them have moved on. We want to make sure that we're running all 22 districts from this election onwards, from every local government, provincial council, and so on, because we have 
rich talent on the ground, young people, young and old, who just were well, not career politicians, but who are people of substance, people of integrity, and people who have delivered results in their professions. And they know what they can bring in a class to wherever they serve. And we're hoping that they will be able to run. So we're in it for the long run. You know, I always say this, I'm not responsible for the country I inherited. But now as a father of three sons, I'm responsible for the country that I hand over to them. So when I'm 65 and I'm retiring from public service or retiring from politics in general, I am responsible to make sure that it's, it's a country that's worthy of my children. We refuse to leave the country, but we're not going to wait around and let mediocrity reign without changing it. And that's where we're stepping up. So we're asking for that opportunity to serve. Now, you uh, mentioned earlier the declaration of assets. Mm -hmm. um, that's been a sticky point because um, members of parliament were supposed to declare their assets and they simply didn't. Mm -hmm. and overwhelmingly, they simply did not declare their assets. And even when they did, um, it was a declaration to the speaker. Mm -hmm. um, so it was not immediately made public. Yeah. Um, what is this this secret, the, 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 the veil of yeah. secrecy which go, goes on where, uh, I, where, where there's no transparency? Yeah, I believe uh, Transparency International personally wrote to every parliamentarian asking them to declare their assets publicly every year. And if I'm not mistaken, only 14 parliamentarians have done so even once in the last four years. Only 14 out of 225. If you're not able to be accountable and be transparent, you're hiding something. And if you're hiding something, more likely it is blatant corruption. And therefore what we're saying is, like even now for contesting, you're supposed to declare assets. They put it in an envelope and then they want you to put it in another envelope. And they're saying they're not even going to open it unless somebody comes and asks about it. We're saying if we're elected, our, our, declared, our assets will be public. You can go to my website or our party website, and you know, this is where Prashant's assets are. This is what he does. And then every year I'm committing, it's not law yet, but I'm committing to say, this is my, this year's assets. And if there's a massive spike that I become a millionaire overnight, you can ask the question, where did this come from? Have you been doing something outside the realms of the law? That's what we want. Because like, I'm sad to say this, but even our current president and our former opposition leader have never declared their assets publicly until this presidential election been in politics for 25 years. They say they have, they've given it to the speaker. It's a sealed document, that means nothing. Yeah, all, for, all we know, for all we know, it's just an empty piece of paper. No one's opened it. We haven't had the right to go ask them for that. So what I'm saying is that has to change. I would like the president and his cabinet to declare the assets every year because we want to see. And then how do you maintain this lifestyle that you have with a parliamentarian salary? Like, how is this possible? People need to be able to ask those questions. And you, well, we can't do go back in time, but we can do it now. So we want to change that culture. We want to walk the talk, and we hope our president and the government and the newly appointed government follow suit. Now, even the taxpayers are supposed to declare their assets. There is a part of that form where you have to list out what you have. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not made public, but it's sent to the Inland Revenue. Yep. So it's there. Um, and if if somebody ever queries how you're driving around in a BMW and you've listed your asset, uh, your vehicle is a Maruti, um, well, there's a clear disparity and inland revenue can come after you. Yeah. Um, but for the politicians, they simply don't declare. Uh, so how would you set about getting this done? Because there's no point appealing to them. Appealing to a politician is like talking to a brick wall, unfortunately. Uh, I'm talking about the politicians that we had. Hopefully, things will change with the new mm -hmm. parliament. Yeah. But how do you ensure this? Yeah. So I think as civil society and media, people have been asking this for a long time. But it does They're not work. So then you need to be people, you need to have people who enter into the system and live it out. <coughs> and then you shine and say, if I can do it, why can't you? Mr. President, why don't you do it? Mr. Opposition Leader, why don't you do it? We have to change this. And then people also start questioning, yes, we would like to see this happening. Because you've seen sometimes politicians living in extreme wealth and glamour and amazing lifestyle in a, on a government salary, but children's malnutrition is soaring. We have allegations of certain politicians having multiple cooks and extremely luxurious lifestyles, at least that's the allegation, while our children... Well, it's not just an in. allegation. It, it, it's 
out there for everyone yeah. to see. So we and then politicians, you know, wearing designer branding, branded clothing and all this, you know, fine. But now let's stop talking about, no, no, we are clean. Prove it. Prove it. Be accountable. If you want that to be seen, we hope that you would give us an opportunity. We will walk the talk. And I feel that's the best way to refine the system. Consider us in Parliament as an opportunity of a filter to filter the system. And that's what we're trying to do. Now, let me get your views on campaign finance. Um, you have on this show, uh, when you appeared before, uh, you were very clear that um, whatever funds a political party or a politician raises needs to be transparent. You need to account for it. Yep. Where did you get <coughs> it? Who gave it to you? Uh, and um, where did you spend it? Yeah. Um, now, we had the presidential election uh, and, of course, we uh, had a glaring error mm -hmm. where uh, there was no transparency. Uh, instead, after the election, uh, each political party was supposed to um, give their uh, little… 21 uh, days after. Yes, 21 days after their accounts. And some of them, some of those 38 candidates actually did not do so, uh, but most did. Um, and now we learn uh, that uh, uh, it's 21 days, plus it took another couple of weeks before this was released by the Election Commission. So uh, after all this time, uh, we learn that uh, the last president, his uh, um, financial statement was just two pages which is quite ludicrous, uh, ludicrous. you know, it, it, it's two pages for an entire presidential campaign. Um, Spending uh, nearly a billion rupees. Yeah, uh, uh, and on the other hand, uh, the NPP has come up with something like a thousand pages. So that that's nice. But um, why is this the exception? Why isn't it the norm? Yeah. So this is something we've been talking about as a political movement for the last four or five years. And we want to walk the talk once again. And if you go on our website, every quarter we update who gave us donations, how did we spend it. And even for this campaign, we're doing it. We're the only party that's doing it publicly. And we're asking the other parties to do the same. Why do you need to wait 39 days after now to declare it? Yes, to do all the receipts and everything, sure, take your time, whatever it is. But we need to demand more accountability and transparency. And that's why you have people who have agendas, who bought over parties, who've literally bought over the agenda, and then they're paying the rest of their term, they're paying them off by giving them tenders, giving them special favors, doing all of that. So the corruption is beginning before government takes oaths the first day of work. And so this is a fundamental issue, campaign finance. Where are you getting your money? Who's donating? Like all of a sudden, the president can go ahead and appoint so many powerful positions. We need to know, was this person a donor? Was this person somebody who supported them? And did they get selected on, a, on their merit? Was there a proper system? Or was it because they were a good donor? We need to know these things, well, whoever is in government. And that's why we have allowed, we have, we have coexisted with deep corruption for so long that we're almost desensitized to it. And we need to change that by having voices that will expose this and then work towards correcting it. Well, you use the word desensitized, but I, I don't think people are desensitized. It is simply that people have a sense of helplessness. Mm -hmm. What do I do? Um, the, the, the guy who ran for office um, before he became uh, an MP or a minister, uh, he was going around on a motorcycle. Now he's in a luxury vehicle. Uh, what do I do about that? I mean, I can put it on social media. I can shout it. Uh, uh, all across the land, but nothing happens. So that sense of helplessness is the problem, isn't mm -hmm. it? Um, and it's it's to do with all the institutions in the country which are supposed to monitor and take care of these issues. The Inland Revenue, the Bribery Commission, uh, the Excise Department, but all of these are among the most corrupt departments in the country. So you're asking uh, crooks to be policed by bigger crooks. How would you set about reforming this? This is the system change that we need. Yeah. So this is where I think whoever comes into government, people are expecting that kind of change. 
dramatic change. So, you know, they're, they're looking for results, they're looking for decisive action, and they don't want to see the same reality repeat itself. So this president and his party have made grand promises, and they need to deliver from day one. There is no, we'll give you, you know, two years to get your act together. No, it's from day one. These things have to happen. And people are realizing that if that's not sorted, their lives will continue to be hindered, and this economy will never grow. We'll never see the development Sri Lanka is capable of. So I think it's important. But what happens is when, when somebody living under the poverty line is trying to put food on the table tonight to feed their children, and then trying to find work the next morning, trying to make it, it's hard for them to figure out campaign finance and asset declaration. And so after a while, they're like, yeah, that's just how it is. What to do? I had to do this. And so that's where we have to change this reality of bring it to the attention of people saying, this is all connected. And then also have people who live it out so that we put the pressure on the career politician and the established party saying that their days are numbered if they do the same actions of the past. Now, let me uh, change track a little bit and ask you about your party's uh, stance on women's representation. Um, it's abysmal right now, 5% uh, in parliament, uh, lowest in South Asia, and South Asia doesn't have a lot to write home about uh, anyway, but we are the lowest. Um, among your candidates, uh, what's the percentage of women? Yeah. So we said that from the very beginning that we're thriving, we're striving for 50% of women uh, representation. Even in our nominations, I think we hit at least 42% in our, in our districts, uh, around, hovering around that number. I know it's higher than the establishment, but then again, we're only running in four districts this time, so I don't think it's a fair comparison. But what we found is uh, in our political academy, we have more than 50% who are women, who want to run for office. Our academy is not an academic institute. It's an academy to run. And so we have seen that. And so there is not a lack of women's interest. But we have also seen this time, though, there were many women who were supposed to run, uh, had to back out because of the online bullying and harassment that, you know, any new party coming in, anyone challenging the system, the, the harassment that's happening by some of these established parties. They've had almost people on payroll to destroy anybody who has an alternate view to their view. And it, it's a lot of uh, struggle to take on. And, and, and especially a man coming in and challenging the question, there's some type of bullying and online harassment. But for a woman, we've seen it is it more targeted. It's, it's dehumanizing and attacking. I've talked to many young women who want to run for office saying, I've had to shut down my Facebook. I have to shut down my Instagram. I can't take it anymore in the sense of it's, it's too much. Politics is already hard, but that's a new reality that's coming into play. And so I hope that the government will look into this reality of, of when somebody uh, trying but, to... But again, why are you hoping that the government will look well, into it? We that's have, what they've said. We have uh, so many acts of parliament yeah. which deal with this. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I mean, our laws are very strict. Uh, you speak of social media. We, we've got that contentious uh, online safety act, which is quite draconian. Uh, but why isn't that being applied? Um, and then... Uh, you know, we, we live in a country where literally if you brush against a woman on a bus, you could be arrested. That, that, that's the letter of the law. Um, of course, that's not applied in that way, but that's the letter of the law. Uh, so we have the laws. They're simply not being applied. Mm -hmm. or They are applied only when the party in office um, decides that, well, let's apply the law. Yeah. So I think that's something especially for the current president to, to look into uh, is that obviously their rise to power had a lot to do with social media and, and an effective use of it to market their campaign, to show that they're different, show that they're not the establishment, even though they've been around for 45 years in politics, to show that they are new and they deserve an opportunity. But at the same time, along with that, there have been many loyal supporters of the party. Uh, or new supporters of the party who have taken to a very aggressive, almost ragging, bullying type of use of social media to silence opposing voices or to silence voices that are raising some critique, bots or fake profiles and things like that. So I feel sometimes when it benefits you, your party, some politicians may feel 
let it just slide because this works in our favor right now. So I hope that's not what this government will do. They will see that this is an emerging problem and people in their name who are supporting them are doing that and there will be action taken. And in general, we have to create an environment where nobody, just because of their gender, their ethnicity, their religion, their socioeconomic status, feel that they are thoroughly dis disadvantaged to engage in the political arena. It's not just social media. When it comes to women, the moral challenges are, are real. And party leadership needs to work to make sure that you even the playing field. We're not asking for an equality of outcome. We're asking for an equality of opportunity and a level playing field so that the right leaders can emerge. And 50%, I would say even more than 50% of our greatest leaders in this country are women. And we need them in government. We need them in the corporate sector. We have to stop giving excuses. And that's one thing we're doing as a party. We've promised the people of Gampa that if we come into power, if we are given a seat, or even if not, we're trying to create 200 daycare centers for women from mothers from lower middle income communities because a lot of them can't expand their business. They can't go back to work. They can't because they can't afford daycare. But if you have daycare centers that are healthy places for their children to stay, safe environments, you're going to help the economy thrive. And we're telling this to mothers from low income communities, we want to do this, we will do this, we will deliver because we need to help the economy restart and we need to ensure that our economy is not paralyzed where only 50% is really able to perform, where you're making it sure that women are able to actively contribute to the economy to the best of their potential and not with any significant long-term limitations. Now, Prashant, uh, this government is now, I believe, 38 days old, mm -hmm. a little over a month. Um, of course, they've been uh, handicapped by the fact that they have only three ministers, including the president, uh, the president, prime minister, and one other minister. Um, so you can't expect miracles. Um, however, I'd like your take on how have they performed so far uh, and the, how indicative is it of uh, how they will perform in the future? I think it's very difficult to do an assessment uh, in less than a uh, quarter and, and to see them. And also when they are crippled by the fact that there are just three of them. That's their choice. They could have worked with some people in parliament, but they stuck to their narrative that all these guys are crooks and we won't have nothing to do with them. So we'll, three of us will do it. There are limitations in that. There will be inefficiencies in that. And it's not the government that hurts. The people will hurt because of these inefficiencies, but they want to stick to the narrative or they decided they, they can do it. So there will be places the ball will be dropped and uh, that will be on them. You can't blame it. You can't say it's just the three of us. They decided to be the three of us. Absolutely. Right? And so we have to hold them accountable to that. Uh, but I think trying to minimize ex uh, government expenses, trying to ensure they're countering corruption, all those things that they say, they've started saying the right things, trying to live by it. And we want to be a, stra a supporting hand and, a, and an affirming and an encouraging and supporting hand when they do the right thing. But when they wear off, like for example, I don't know how long they'll say this, but when it comes to the Anti-Terrorism Act, or at least the PTA, you know, the, the NPP and the JVP have been against this from the very beginning. But now to say that they're not going to be removing it anytime soon, the abolishing of the executive presidency, now to hear some of their members say, you know, that's going to happen later on, maybe at the end of this presidential term, that's a little alarming. Some of those things are alarming. And then also excuses of saying, well, uh, we just need more time. You, you can't always now, you can't tell you how difficult it is for you. That's the job you asked for. If you can't take the heat, you're going to get out of the kitchen. So we need to give them time. But at the same time, that narrative won't last for too long. In my personal opinion, give them a quarter, give them the ability to get their act together, and then the real game starts where we have to hold them accountable. But still, you said you'll govern from day one. You didn't ask for a term from minus three months, then we'll govern. No, you're governing from day one, so you're responsible, and it's time for you to deliver. But once this election takes place in 13 days' time, um, whichever party is elected, um, we are stuck with that party for the next uh, not quite five years uh, because the president can always dissolve after a, pretty much um, yeah. Yeah, about three years, but uh, three and a half, I believe. Uh, but we are stuck with them. Um, so how do we get them to to work? So now we are making a decision for the next five years, <coughs> and so we're asking the people: absolute cover, uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. If that's true. You have this all-powerful executive presidency. And if you feel now giving 
two thirds or a very dominant majority to them is going to solve problems, that's a danger. If they don't deliver, there's nothing you could do about it. It's important to have a balance of power, strong sense of accountability. And that's why we're asking a new opposition of people from the previous opposition, or maybe who knows who will win the election, but whatever, have a balance set up. Some families we're asking, don't blindly vote, the entire, all family members vote for one party. They say, hey, let's allow some new groups to go in. In Gampa, we're asking you, okay, you've made up your mind, you've, you're voting for this party, fine. You have four votes in your house, give us one. Give us an opportunity to hold them accountable. Don't give absolute power. Let's learn from our mistakes. You know, we can't, uh, Gota's regime, they asked for power, you gave them presidency, you gave them two thirds, and then for four years, even if you hated them and they devastated the economy, you watched them. Now, you don't know, they're not going to be like Gota, they're going to be different. Are you sure? We have no guarantees. So, because we don't have guarantees, let's take the precaution of having independence in, par uh, in parliament as well. So, give us an opportunity. That's our, our plea and our request at this time. And I'm afraid we have run out of time. Uh, Prashant Divisa, it's been a scintillating conversation. Thank you mm -hmm. very much for dropping by. Um, and all the very best. Can I make a closing statement? Certainly, certainly. Yes. Uh, to the voters of Gampa, you're used to have voting to the three main political parties. Have they served you well? If you want somebody truly to serve you in government, in parliament, we ask you to consider us. The King Coconut, the National Development Front. I'm here to serve, we're here to serve. Give us an opportunity. If you have four votes in your house and you're not sure you just want to give one, we just need 75,000 of you to say, we want to give them a shot. We're here to serve, we will deliver, we'll be accountable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prashant. And thank you to you at home for watching. Don't go away because the news is coming up next. Have a good evening.